It says I have an excellent connection. It says I'm live. All right, let's see if it works this time. Okay, um, I think All right, so I am going to, okay, it looks like at least one other person is there, <laughs> okay. Ah, that was very stressful, a um, few minutes. So um, I figured that there would be something going wrong uh, at some stream, and it happened right at the beginning. Uh, so uh, I'm not wearing my glasses because I can't see this distance with my uh, glasses. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy it's finally working. That was uh, very nerve-wracking. We rehearsed many, many times, and then, of course, um, everything went wrong. So I'm sitting in my office. I'm in uh, sitting in my desk right now. So this setup is different than what I normally um, do. So... Um, Normally, if you see me talking to the camera, I'm actually standing uh, over there um, in front of that bookcase there, or I'm sitting in a chair. There's a little table right there, but right now I'm sitting at my desk and using a webcam and um, just the computer audio, but I do have um, my phone set up for an overhead so that um, if somebody has a question, then I might be able to demonstrate something for you or I can draw something if you want to understand how something works I might be able to do that for you so hello everybody um it's um so nice that uh, some people showed up that was the other thing I was afraid of so I just want to um some of you I assume everybody here is a subscriber um some of you may be longtime subscribers some of you may be new subscribers some of you who have been around a long time may not have seen every single um, video that I've created, which is totally understandable. So I thought I'd just uh, start off with a little background about me and then why I decided to do um, some live streaming. Um, so the, I've had my channel here for since 2007. So for the first 10 years, I used it sort of sporadically. And mostly it was used to create videos that were reference material for classes I was teaching at my yarn shop. Or uh, I also wrote a, it's called Ask a Knitter, a column on Ravelry. In the early years, they had a newsletter called This Week in Ravelry, and I would answer questions. I'd kind of answer a question and take uh, photos and really go in-depth with the answers. And sometimes I would include uh, videos that went along with those. So... That was kind of how I used the channel. I never, and, and I kind of only did techniques if I thought there was a specific reason for doing them. I just never thought of just doing them every single week the way I have been doing them. So, uh, but the yarn shop where I taught uh, closed in 2016 and I needed to figure out another way to teach and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I decided to do technique videos. So I did that for a year and then I thought, okay, I've got the hang of this. I'm going to start, I, I, but I have other things I want to talk about, about knitting. So I started doing the casual Friday videos. So then at the, after doing both of those for a year, um, I just kept going. And so this year, after three years of doing technique Tuesday, every single Tuesday, I, um, I felt like I was in a little bit of a rut and that's something I try to be really careful about is not getting bored and always keeping myself interested. Boy, there's a lot of you. I'm so happy to see everyone. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to back off the technique videos a little bit just so that I wouldn't get bored and I'm still doing them. Um, and my idea was I was going to be te doing more in-person teaching um, than I have in the past couple of years. I'm scheduled to teach at a weekend retreat later this month, which of course got canceled. And it just, who knows when it, we're going to be able to do those kind of events again. So I thought this might be another way of interacting um, with people um, and, and maybe get sort of a sense of teaching and maybe we'll see how this goes because it usually takes me a while of doing one type of video for me to see how it works and uh, what I like about it, what people are responding to, and what I might want to do in the future. So 
I'm seeing a lot of you um, chatting here. And um, so I'm going to try, I'm going to, I'm looking through the comments to see if anybody has a specific um, question. Um, if not, I have a few to get started with that were in um, some of the videos this week. And, um, and then if you have other questions, I'll do my best to try to keep track of, of what people are asking or want to know. You can ask a, any question or you can just ask a question about me and if you want to know something about my background. And that would be fine. So um, um, for, for those of you who maybe are, haven't seen every one of my Casual Friday um, videos, um, I'll let you know when I've done a more uh, complete video on a topic like this. Um, first of all, there is a whole playlist of the Casual Friday videos. So if you wanted to, you could go to on my channel and just find the playlist that says Casual Friday. Um, and you could start at the beginning and see kind of how the Casual Friday videos evolve. Um, the technique videos can really vary quite a lot. And I know some of you uh, watch Casual Friday every week and, and only watch technique videos if you need them. So I, there is kind of two different audiences. So um, somebody is asking, how do you make a knitted mat? Well, I guess I would just uh, get a yarn that you like, probably cotton, and uh, appropriate needle size for it, and cast on an, enough stitches and made it as wide as you wanted, and just knit and garter stitch until you have had enough of it. Probably, uh, you might even double or triple strand uh, the yarn together to make um, the stitches big enough. You need to need bigger needles to do that as well. So. Um, you're new to knitting and you want to jump right in and design a sweater. Is this possible for a beginner? Uh, that uh, depends on what kind of sweater it is that you are thinking of designing. Um, and um, it's not impossible. I would say uh, when I learned to knit, it was the 80s, and so everything was just oversized and big, and if your head fit through the hole um, in the neck and the sleeves were the right length, it fit you. So it was pretty easy to knit a sweater that fit, and most of, most of them had very simple shaping. Shaping um, can be more complicated now, depending on what it is you're looking for, but uh, but really, you you know, uh, the simplest sweater is a couple of rectangles. You could make it a boat neck so you wouldn't even have to do neck shaping. You use a stitch pattern that you like. You still have to understand something about gauge so that you understand how many stitches you need to cast on. Um, and uh, sleeve shaping, um, if you know how to do increases or decreases. Um, what you could do is take a simple sweater that you already own and kind of take the measurements and see how big it is. So it's not in, it's not impossible. Um, you certainly can knit sweaters from the beginning. Everything I knit for the first 19 years I was a knitter was a sweater. Um, it didn't occur to me to knit anything else. So it's kind of depends on how adventurous you are. Um, it's a big project and as a new knitter it might seem like it's taking you forever because you might also be a slower knitter, not as efficient. So uh, it just depends on your motivation, whether or not that is something that you want to tackle. There's, I'm never going to say to somebody if they want to do something that they shouldn't do it. Um, when I had beginning classes uh, and people say, well, what can I knit next? And I would always say, well, what do you want to knit? Because that's the thing that you're going to be excited about. But some people really want to be directed. Tell me what I can do now. Tell me what I can do next. And other people are just like, uh, oh, I want to do, I want to, I want to do that, and then they learn the things that they need to do that. So it's not impossible. Jackie wants to know how the twenty sweater is going, and if I would have any advice for beginning a plus size sweater. Um, the nineteen twenty sweater is just on a little uh, time, not time out. I'll probably be talking about this on Friday. Um, in the past couple of weeks, when I realized I didn't have any other projects, I've been kind of 
I'm setting myself up to have more projects that I can rotate around depending on how I'm feeling that day, if I'm feeling stressed out or if I'm feeling um, like I really want to think. So today I was working on a list of all of the things that I want to be working on. Some things are small projects that I would consider mindless, like socks, and then some are this, these sweaters that I am uh, working on and just thinking about what uh, stage of those sweaters, like what are the tasks involved in those uh, different sweaters or these different projects that I would want to work on. It's almost the opposite of the finish it February routine that I had when I had a lot of UFOs where I would rotate between the UFOs. I would get a sleeve done and then I would do a second sock and then I would do a square of a blanket. And it's almost the opposite of, of that right now. So the 20 sweater is, is in there, and I, I think part of it is that it's a, the, I, I'm at, you know, I, I've exceeded the three or four week tolerance that I have, and I'm on the finishing parts that are crochet, so it's not knitting, and I think ultimately that's the thing that kind of slowed me down, is that it's not knitting, because that will slow me down on a project where I've got all the knitting done, and then I just have sewing to do. I'll sometimes put it to the side. So... I have created a list, it's in the spreadsheet of course, of all these different projects and what I want to do and kind of how I want to rotate through them. So the 20s sweater is on the list for this week. Um, I'm not working on it right, right this second. I write uh, today I, and yesterday, let me get this without knocking anything over, I've been working on it's so dark, uh, my Aaron sweater. I'm up to the armhole, so I, I bound off for the armhole. So I'll finish the back of this sweater, and then I'll work into the next uh, thing, probably something with the Roaring Twenties sweater. Can I show you the setup for how I do my Technique Tuesday videos with the camera on your hands? Um, well, so the setup that I have right, but I'm doing these... Um, this uh, live stream is really different from what I normally do. So let me, hold on one second. I have this little table behind me um, that I sit behind when I do Casual Friday. I don't even know if I could probably lift this up and show you a little bit. I don't think you can see it. It's, just, it's a little, it's like a little lamp table and I have on this audio thing on there that my mic is connected to and I have my pieces of paper on there that I'm my notes that I need to check my camera is this little camera it's a Sony I can never remember it's a RX 102 I mean they still sell this they but they have they're up to the RX 100 five or six or something like that so it's a point and shoot camera but it has manual settings so um, when I am um, on a Technique Tuesday video, when I'm talking to the camera, this is on a tripod that's up pretty high, and I have this kind of uh, teleprompter set up. I can show you that if you want. <laughs> I'm right here. So it's this little thing that sits on the tripod. I put the camera right here. And then there's this little glass part here. This covers up to hide it. And then I put an iPad on here that has what it is I'm reading. That's for the face to the camera stuff. For the overhead, I have um, a table down in our basement that's just set up. Uh, we have an unfinished basement, so it's just in the middle of the basement. And I have a, a table with this kind of gray fleece covering it. And then we've got um, some lights on either side that get keep everything real, uh, lit up. And then across the table from me is a, I think it's a mic stand. I don't even think it's a tripod. So it comes up vertically and then it comes horizontally over the top of the table. So then this camera is sitting over the top of me like this. So I can't see through the viewfinder. So I have a little monitor that's hooked up to it, but the problem is that this is upside down, so I have the monitor upside down so I can see what I'm doing. So then I can zoom in, I can um, do various different things. So, so it's a pretty elaborate setup. So what I'm doing right here 
is very different. I'm talking to a webcam using my uh, laptop audio, and I've got my iPhone uh, hooked up right here. I can show you. Let me see. So I could do picture in picture right here. And what's going on there? Oh, my phone is showing me something. You know what that's saying there? Um, so I could uh, demonstrate something like this, but this isn't how I normally do things. This is very different, which is one of the reasons I was a little stressed out at the beginning. Have I produced or planned to technique videos on a fisherman's rib as an alternative to brioche, specifically for increases, decreases? I have not produced that. You know, brioche is something that's really really popular with people and I get asked a number of times if I if I have done any brioche videos and there's something about uh, brioche and double knitting uh, which is related to brioche um, that I find beautiful to look at um, but I do not find um, interesting to knit and so I tend not to do technique videos on things that I just am not interested in doing. So, you know, <laughs> sorry. Um, let's see, question. I have 400 yards of gorgeous fingering yarn and no idea what to do with it. Any hints, please? Also, what would be the best way to create a scarf with color work that looks okay on both sides? So, um, so with the fingering weight, you 400 yards of fingering weight sounds like 100 grams of pretty standard fingering weight. What I do when I have something like that where I have a limited amount of yarn um, is I use the Ravelry advanced search capability. So you go um, and you, uh, to the, the patterns tab and then there's a little box where you can type things in but don't type anything in there. Right underneath there's a link to the advanced pattern search. And from there, you'll, um, you'll get um, a page that will show you a bunch of patterns. But on the left-hand side of the screen, you have all these ways of filtering things out. You can choose projects in particular, like, oh, I want to knit something with cables. Or you can say, I have fingering weight yarn, and this is how much I have of it. Show me projects. And then you can say, oh, I don't want to knit a hat. And so you can eliminate hats, or you can narrow things down that way. That's what I do when I have a single skein of something and I'm not sure what I want to do with it. The other thing you can do is look up that yarn in the yarn database and see what other people have used, um, have made from it. Because then if sometimes people will use more than one yarn and they'll use something with that. And you can see how people have used it for say color work. I think the other part of your question was uh, how do you do something in color work that looks good on both sides? You can do one of two things. You can either knit it in the round. So if you did like a fair aisle pattern that was just geometric patterns or something like that, you could just knit a tube in the round and then you could close the two ends and do fringe or something like that. Or, excuse me, you could do uh, something in double knitting. And um, that way you can do things where you have sort of the negative, if you had two colors on one side and you had some kind of interesting design, then on the other side you would have the same design but in reverse. And there's even ways to do um, things that are not the same on both sides, but again, it's not something I've explored deeply. Uh, I took a class from Lucy Neatby a few years ago and she does a lot of double knitting things. So if you were looking in for something with double knitting, that would be one place um, to, to explore to see what she's done or something like that. Um, let's see. You totally missed the Technique Tuesdays. They're not totally gone. I'm just not doing them every, every week. Let's see. Um, you would see Emma would like to learn to alter sweaters, particularly necklines. There are a lot of sweaters I would like to knit, but I just like boat necks. Are there any resources you would recommend? Yes. Let me just pull one. Um, let's see. So there are a lot of books on design. Let me pull another one. 
So this one is just Designing Knitwear by Deborah Newton. Um, this is a really good one, and it's, it's one I come back to. Um, the more I know about knitting, the more I see in there some really ingenious things um, that I, I couldn't really take in when I was um, less experienced. But so this is a good book. This uh, Ann Budd has a whole series of books called um, the, the Knitter's Handy Book of, and she's got sweater patterns. She's got one that's just basic patterns like socks and mittens and hats and things like that. And then she's got one for top-down sweaters. But these sweaters are any gauge, and any gauge, and then any size from like, I don't know if it's two years old or four years old, all the way up to an extra large adult. And there's schematics, and so you can see how the necklines are shaped, and you can do that kind of uh, thing. The other thing is to look at um, a sweater that you've knit that has a neckline that you like or you see a sweater that you like that has a neckline and look at what the measurements are. How wide is it across the back and then how deep is it? For something like a v-neck, often the, the, the v is started at the same time as the underarm. It gets filled in more because of the ribbing, um, but that's one way to do, say, a v-neck. But if you have something rounded that you like, I've noticed with the vintage sweaters that they had a much narrower back of neck, and I find that I really like that. So I was just planning the neck for my Aaron sweater today, the back and the front, and I was using my old Aaron sweater that has a lot of things about the size that I really like, and, but I, the neck is too wide, and I was looking at it closely today, and part of the reason I think I just used too many ribbing stitches, I should have gone down. Uh, and I think it, that's part of the reason why it, it, it flares open. But if you have something that you like, the way it fits, measure it and figure out how big that is. Um, let's see. Well, I submit one of my vintage sweaters into the Minnesota State Fair. You know, um... I don't even know if they're going to have the state fair this year. I was thinking about that. Um, I, they may they may end up canceling it. So, um, but that the, my 1920 sweater, if it turns out well, <laughs> that was something I would consider. I haven't entered the fair for the past few years. Once I completed the master hand knitting program, um, I did submit some of the things that um, that I that were part of my level three. Um, like the sweater that I knit and a couple of other things that I um, had designed and had published a design for something. I submitted the actual samples and I, and I won some ribbons and I was really happy. Um, what I used the fair for prior to that was kind of getting feedback um, as a way of getting um, feedback from another source other than the committee members of the master hand knitting program. Um, and I don't feel like I need that anymore. So I typically just like to go and see what, what everybody else is doing. Uh, I want to know how the 20 sweater is going. Uh, and I ask if you would have any advice for beginning a plus size sweater. I think I, told, I mentioned what was going on with the 20 sweater. I'm going to be getting back to, to it this week. Um, it's, it's toward the end. And it's one of those things where um, I just am going to be working on it. Off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish all of the collar squares, redoing all the collar squares. Got all the colored ones done. Now I have to do the beige ones. And um, I had to separate the yarn plies, uh, uh, which is a real, pay, uh, a real pain to do. Um, so once I get those squares done, then I'll work on um, my daughter's uh, boyfriend's uh, sock. And then I'll work on some, you know, I'm going to start rotating through things. So... Sometimes when I get really close to the end, then I just power through. But right now, it's a little, it's getting a little tired of it. Um, your casual Friday discussing blow yarn blew my mind and opened me up to a bunch of great new projects. I've learned so much. I look forward. Oh, thank you. That's great. That blow yarn blew my mind <laughs> because I didn't pick it out. You know, I showed up at, um, if for any of you that don't, that don't know, a couple of years ago, um, for holidays, I told my mother-in-law I'd knit her an accessory of some sort. And 
So um, we arranged to meet at, at this yarn shop here in town that is um, run by a man who used to be like vice president of design for Perry Ellis or something. He, he has that kind of background and he grew up, his mom had a yarn shop. So it's, it's called Stephen B. If you're ever in Minneapolis, it's worth going to because it's such a different yarn shop. And that was the place I knew to go for knitting an accessory. Like I wouldn't go there to buy a bunch of Cascade 220 in a solid color to knit a sweater. It's not the kind of shop for that. Um, but it really interesting, cool yarns is. And so she got there early and she'd, she had been, you know, taken around to all of the samples and the yarns and she picked out the yarn and the pattern she wanted me to make and it was all waiting for me. And um, like, okay, there's some yarn and I was uh, swatching with it and I was like, what is this? So blow yarn, it's like a tube. Often the tube is made from nylon. This was like a more of a luxury yarn. So the tube was made of silk and it was dyed the same color as the fibers. A lot of times you'll see these blow yarns, it'll be like a cotton tube and it's in white and the, and then the colored fibers are different. So I don't like those as much. It's they, they're just different ways of presenting the same kind of thing. But it, the fibers, things like alpaca or silk or things that maybe wouldn't normally have um, elasticity or wouldn't hold up well, um, are blown into this tube and it's very light, very airy. And um, it's just such a different knitting experience. So that really sent me on a path of trying to try other types of yarn constructions as well. And then I think that might have been the year I learned decided to learn to spin too. So learning to spin has taught me a lot about yarn construction. It hasn't turned me into a fanatical spinner, but it's taught me a lot about uh, yarn. Okay, let's see. Um, it's possible to use a ball winder without a swift. Sure. Uh, one thing that you can do is um, if you have a, a straight backed chair, I mean, you can do this if you don't have a, bind, uh, a ball winder or a swift, but you have the hank in the big loop and you put it around uh, the chair like that. And then you, that's just holding the yarn. Or you can use, uh, some people use a lampshade and they do it so that it's not on tight so that it will spin around. They don't screw the thing on the top really, really tight. And so they can put that, um, uh, the yarn around the lampshade. So what else? How do you put DK back on your needles after frogging several rows? Oh, well, here's an overhead thing I can kind of show you. Let me put these books. Oh, I'll just toss them. So, I've run over my knitting. Ah, hold on one second. I have a tall desk, and so I have a very tall uh, chair. I can stand at this desk, uh, or I can sit at it. Usually, I end up sitting at it. But um, okay, let me do the overhead if I can. Okay, so if you take your needle out of your stitches, you just, like they come out, and you have to get a new. I'll I'll just draw the row. What happens a lot of times is the stitches want to turn in the opposite way um, that makes it convenient for you to get them on the needle. So what I do is I just put them on the needle however I can get them on. So these are going on the needle the wrong way. And sometimes if you have some knits and some purls, some of them are going to be you know, wanting to come forward and some wanting to go um, backwards. And it's in, the point is just get them back on the needles. So I've got a couple more to do like this. So now uh, when it's time for me to knit, I can either go back over all these and get them seated back on the, on the needle correctly, or I can just look at how that stitch is seated on the needle. I don't have my good the zoom in. Um, this one is seated on the needle correctly.
but if I look at, at um, this stitch, it's it's seated with the, the leading leg. That's the leg of the stitch that's closest to the tip is in the back. So I could remount it like this, and then I could knit it. Uh, oh, this is an incomplete stitch. Watch me do my gymnastics there. Okay, um, so this one's sitting on, so I could just come through the back here. So as I'm entering, pushing through that leading leg, and then I can just knit it like that. Okay. Have I produced, oh no, I already did answer that one. What's going on here? Um... trying to uh, scroll through these here. Um, I came up one row short on a shawl project. If I decide to re-knit, should I go with the smaller or larger needles? I don't want to purchase more yarn. Are you saying, if you're saying that you ran out of yarn when you were one row before you, the last row, um, if you want, the way, the it, it depends on if you're planning on using the same number of stitches and you're planning on working for the same number of rows, um, if you use a smaller needle, you'll use less yarn, but the shawl will be smaller as well. If you use a larger needle, then, but you knit the same number of stitches on the same number of rows, it's going to end up bigger and you're going to run out of yarn. But if you use larger needles, and you change the number of, of stitches in rows, um, then you would use less yarn because the, you have fewer rows per inch. So it's kind of a tricky question to answer, but if you're going to knit it exactly as it says with the same number of stitches and the same number of rows, using a smaller needle um, will let the, the yarn go further. Um, You use, somebody uses an air freshener can as a base for winding center pole. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, let's see. You saw one of my videos about how there are two ways to remount the stitches during a knitted cable cast on. Oh, I thought that was fascinating. I used to struggle with why friends cast on. To, yeah, that was, uh, that was weird for me when I saw somebody doing the knitted cast on and I was like, why are they doing it that way? They're doing it wrong. Wait, am I doing it wrong? <laughs> um, it is interesting to see. Is it possible to make a v-neck sweater without set in sleeves? I want three quarter sleeve. Yeah, the, your, the, the neck line has nothing to do with your sleeves. So, um, those are two separate decisions. A lot of people make raglan sweaters, and um, even that, though, you have control over what you're doing with your neckline, um, but you're kind of stuck with the raglan sleeves. So, so uh, let me let me get a piece of paper, and I'll just do an overhead. Let me find a pen. Okay, so when you are designing a sweater, you have different parts. You have the body, and you have uh, the neck, and you have the sleeves. So what you do with the neck is you decide, do I want a round neck? Do I want a V-neck? Do I want a boat neck? You know, what kind of neck do I want? Then the next thing you think about is how you want your armholes to be. So if you, if you just make basically a rectangle with, you know, a scoop in the front um, for the neck. This is what's called a drop shoulder. And so this part's gonna hang over your shoulders, um, but you could just attach a sleeve on there. Then there is something that's called a modified drop shoulder. I think it's sometimes called a peasant shoulder. And that's where you just bind off a few stitches um, and then you go straight up. And that's what I'm doing for my Aaron sweater show you. I'm just getting started. I just bound off and I'm just 
I bound off for the underarm and I'm just going to keep going all the way up until I get to uh, the shoulder and it, there's no sort of armhole shaping. And for uh, for these kinds of sweaters, the drop shoulder and the modified drop, basically you, you might have a little bit of straight in the sleeve, but otherwise it just it goes like that. There's no a real cap there at all. So what, again, what you're doing with the neck has nothing to do with what you're doing um, for the sleeves and the body. So the armhole, the, the sleeve and the armhole are dependent on each other, but... Um, the neck is completely, completely separate. Um, still working on my first sweater. It's not hard. Definitely taking more time. Or maybe you were talking to somebody else. <laughs> do you knit lace shawls with lace weight yarn? I do not. I love looking at lace. There's certain things I love looking at, um, but I don't want to knit. And I don't use shawls. I don't accessorize. I don't, uh, I have knit lace, but it, it's not, I love cables. <laughs> if, if I had to rank things, it would be uh, cables and other texture, uh, color work, including Stranded or Intarsia. Um, and, and lace would come later. I do it occasionally. Sometimes I'll mix it with cables. But, um, and I don't, I, I like working with fingering weight yarn. I, lace, you tend to use a larger needle than what would be recommended on the, on the ball band because you, you want something that has more drape and is looser and more open. And even with regular yarns, when you're using a larger needle, there's something about those combinations of the yarn being much thinner than, than the needle that I, I don't enjoy. Um, some people just do amazing stuff that blows my mind, but it, I, I don't, I don't even think I have any lace weight yarn. I did at one point, I had a little bit of lace weight yarn, um, but I, I don't use it for anything. I use a lot of fingering weight yarn, uh, for socks mostly, and I use a lot of worsted weight yarn and everything else is very limited that I use. Um... Let's see. Somebody says, I've made several projects in brioche, but I don't enjoy it. <laughs> you know, that's the great thing about knitting. You have so many choices. And you, it, sometimes people will be like, everybody's like, everyone in the internet is all knitting all the same thing. And I think, why are they knitting that? And, and I, it has no appeal to me. And then sometimes I realize that I can't really say it's a dumb project. Nobody should, nobody should do that. Or why does anybody do that unless I try it myself? So there are a few things where I'm like, I don't get that. And so I try it and I go, Ooh, like socks were something where I, I didn't understand what the point was until I tried them on. And I was like, okay, uh, that makes sense. Dishcloths, another thing I thought was kind of dumb. And then I made them. I'm like, Oh no, I like them. Baby surprise jacket, Elizabeth Zimmerman, who I think she was sort of a, a knitting engineering genius. Um, but I, I like really adorable, cute baby sweaters. And I never thought it was that cute. It's very utilitarian. Um, and as a piece of engineering, a knitting engineering, that's amazing. I'm glad I did it once. Um, but I don't think any of the recipients appreciate the ingenuity of the construction. And it's, you know, it's a utilitarian sweater. But a lot of people love love that so what people love to you know love to make is is what they love to make so you do you i uh, you have a great video on tubular cast on for different types of ribbing could you make one on how to do a tubular bind off for two by two ribbing you know i don't use i mean i could do one um i don't like the tubular bind off for two by two because I don't like the way that it kind of torques over. It, you have to, in order to get that to work, it kind of has to twist a little bit and it's, then it ends up being not very stretchy. So there's always so sort of a downside to like, oh, we can actually make this happen, but then there's a downside to it. 
I think that June Hemmen Hyatt's book, Principles of Knitting, that she may have come up with a way of doing that, but maybe not. It might have been that uh, alternating two by two cast on that she came up with. I, I haven't looked to see. If she has, I will look. I, I'll write that down. Uh, I will look and see if, if, if Principles of Knitting, if she has figured out how to do a two by two tubular ribbing that doesn't. Uh, twist or torque. Um, I will do a video on that because I think that would be interesting. Uh, I was almost invited to teach beginner knitters at a yarn shop I go to, but that was just before quarantine. So if the invitation keeps up, I want to ask, do you have any tips? Um, you know, I had never taken a knitting class um, before I started teaching knitting, and so I wasn't even sure how they worked. <laughs> and one of the things that surprised me, and if you've taken knitting classes yourself, like if that's how you learn to knit, you might be a little more aware of, of kind of how they work. But I wasn't. I was the kind of knitter who, who wanted to learn to knit, and I knew what I wanted to make, and I always knew what I wanted to make, and nobody told me I couldn't. Um, so I expected that my knitting students would have a reason why they learned, wanted to learn to knit. And some of them were like that. They're like, oh, I want to make socks. I want to learn how to make socks, you know, so I want to learn to knit. And other people are like, no, uh, my first grandchild is going is, uh, gonna be born, and I want to make something. And so they didn't have any idea of what they wanted to knit, and that surprised me. So one of the things that I realized I had to have was a project uh, for them in the beginning class, because a lot of times the first question they asked was, well, what are we knitting? And I'm like, you're not knitting anything, you're learning how to knit. And so I came up with a project uh, it's a free pattern, and I, I developed it for beginners, and a lot of beginning teachers do use this pattern. It's fine to do that. Um, it's basically a, a square uh, with garter stitch borders so that you can, once they get the hang of the knit stitch, um, then they can cast on the 30 stitches or whatever it is and work garter stitch for a few rows and then they're working garter stitch border and then they're and then stocking it in between. So the nice thing about that is they're learning how to switch between knits and purls but they only have to do that twice in one row. They don't have to do it with ribbing where it, that can be really hard for them to learn to do that. So they only have to do that on the wrong side rows. They do a few stitches of knitting, purl most of them few stitches of knitting and then on the right side they only knit and so that you, you just do this little square and then and then you sew it up and leave a, a hole for the thumb um, and the nice thing about it is that they don't have to finish it they don't have to finish it they don't have to uh, and if they finish the first one they don't have to finish the second one it's the idea is it teaches them how to read a pattern it teaches them how to to do the basics of knit and purl and switching between the two and uh, and that's really what they need. And then from there, they can decide um, what they want to knit. And so it's just a square. And some people, they can. I say, you don't have to make it into a mitt. You can just use it as a coaster. Or you can just throw it in a bin and say, that was my first thing I ever knit. So that would be my tip, would be have a project and have it be something pretty simple. Um, to, to make and that isn't going to take a long time like a scarf it, I think is the worst project to force a beginner to knit it just ugh, I wouldn't I would I, I would never have uh, finished it <laughs> if that was what I had to do uh, what's the best way to join in super wash yarn it's so slippery it seems to pop out um, do you mean so like when you weave in the ends I this isn't really a <laughs> um, when I, if I'm using superwash wool, I have to join a new ball. Uh, the thing that I do when I'm joining a new ball is I just take the, the new one and I just tie a half knot around the old tail and slide it up. So I have a half a knot, so that puts some tension on it while I'm starting to knit. And then later I'll take that knot out. And I typically will do reverse duplicate stitch if it's something like um, 
stockinette. If there's a seam along the edge, I'll bury those in the seam. Um, if it's in the middle of something, like if you're doing something like a shawl that's flat and you have to add it, um, again, I would do a duplicate stitch. But the way I join is with a half knot just to keep some tension on it. Okay. Let's see. Um, so it's nice you guys are chatting with each other. <laughs> so uh, I would like to learn to knit from a chart. I do have some videos on um, reading charts. I did a series, I think it was last fall, maybe in September. Those were Technique Tuesday videos. So there's probably a playlist on charts. Um, so I would suggest looking at that. Um, I think the easiest way is to learn to read them uh, with uh, really basic, uh, with color, it's, you can understand how to read, read the chart with color. It may not be the easiest thing to knit, <laughs> but it's the easiest thing to just instinctively understand is um, color work charts. And then from there, um, doing some basic um, um, texture, but I do have a series of videos on that, so I would I would take a look at that because I kind of built that uh, specifically uh, to take those that in stages. Okay, how can I get stitch patterns to work with a basic sock pattern? Um, when you say if you want to get them to work, do you mean in terms of gauge or I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but if you're using, if you want, if you have like a, a, a stockinette sock pattern that you normally use and you want to use the same yarn, it could very well be that the stitch pattern you want to use is not the same number of stitches per inch. So you need to adjust, um, the stitch count based on the gauge of your stitch pattern. Most knit, just knit purl patterns are going to be pretty much the same as stockinette unless you have a really loose purl gauge compared to your knit gauge because you're, you're knitting it around and introducing purls. Um, it can be, it's a, it's a little bit different if once you get to the end step and you have to divide it uh, to divide the pattern up, that can be a little um, trickier. Sometimes you need to, to figure out how you're going to center that. But um, I don't know how else to answer that, um, except that it's a gauge. It's an issue with gauge. Um, I have a couple of raglan cardigans where because I have had to knit a 42 inch bust size garment to go over my chest. They are very sloppy on my narrow shoulders. Um, yeah, so you, you don't, if you are busty, um, you don't pick your sweater pattern based on your bust measurement. You, pick, you, you wanna do it based on your frame. So one thing that works for some people, because everybody's different, I kind of broad shouldered and like my back goes like this. But some people take this high bust measurement, so above here, and they use that at, to, to choose what size they're going to knit. So you might have a 42 inch bust, but maybe you're only you know 36 or 30. I don't even know what would be a, a typical uh, thing, but, but use that because that's going to indicate what your frame size is. And then you make modifications to accommodate your bust. So there's a good book I have. I'm going to go across uh, the room and get it, and I'll show you. It's uh, by Isolde Teague. It's called uh, Little, uh, Little Red in the City. And she has a website. Um, she is like an online store, so I imagine that you can possibly still get this from her if it's not on Amazon or because it's a, it's a few years old. So it has sweater patterns in here, but what it has that, that she 
designs for a wide range of body sizes. And what she found was um, she was knitting things for some of the larger models in here. And she put the sweater on them and it would look terrible. And she's like, well, why does it look terrible? And then she realized that she hadn't adjusted it in the right way um, to accommodate that person's body. So she includes a huge reference section in the front on how to pick your size and how to how to make these kinds of adjustments and how to look at that. So I, I recommend her book for that. She really um, works at at um, finding ways of making uh, sweaters fit people who, who's, you know, most people are not completely one size. Um, and a lot of us can, can make it work. <laughs> you know, things are close enough, but um, there's always something that isn't quite the same. And it's nice to know, well, how do I adjust for that thing? Um, do I think I will knit a vintage sweater from earlier times than you have, like the 1800s? Well, so here's the thing. Uh, sweaters are a new invention. Like this traditional Danish sweater that I am going to be working on uh, was not called a sweater and it was not used in the way that we wear sweaters today. So sweaters are really a product of the late 19th century and it was, um, it was an athletic garment. So they originally were using um, fine gauge knit fabric that was used for uh, long underwear and for women's underwear. They decided in the 19th century that wool and, and animal fibers were somehow more hygienic than what had been used for underwear before, like cotton and linen. So there was this, this the whole thing, there was this whole industry of all, involved around making uh, underwear and first it was for women and then it was men. And so they would use that fabric um, to make these uh, shirts or, or sweaters. They were items that you were going to sweat in um, for uh, people who were doing like, baseball or football or whatever. Um, well, women were starting to do things like golf and tennis and bicycling. And so then there were uh, sweaters that were for women too, but they were athletic garments. Like you wouldn't, it's not something you would wear to go to a cafe. You shouldn't be wearing a sweater like that um, in a cafe. It's something for your outdoor activities. Um, so that really didn't start until the 18, like 90s, especially for women. So, but this Danish traditional sweater that I'm working on was a layer of clothing that was knitted and had texture patterns that women wore as one of them that they would have their um, underwear and all that stuff on and they put this this star sweater or a night sweater that called it um, on and then they'd have other layers over that so you you see paintings of people from that year and you can just see little uh, little bits of it um, here and there um, so I will the Danish sweater I'm going to be working is probably the closest thing to um, a 19th or 18th century um, sweater. We we would call it a sweater, but it was not a sweater in terms of what we think of sweaters being. So, um, but I am going to be designing my own um, using uh, the techniques that um, the author Vivian Hulksbro, um she's got like a whole stitch dictionary and she's got different examples from museums and all of that. So, uh, thank you for recommending the book, the Suck News Bookshop. Oh, good. Um, well, it's after seven, so I've been at this for about an hour and I'm starting to, um, need, um, a drink. So, um, I thank all of you, um, for, Coming. I'm so happy you showed up. Um, the 183 of you are on here right now. I was worried that nobody was going to show up, but uh, thank you so much. And uh, I, I'm planning on maybe doing this um, maybe at least once a month. I just don't know. I just might evolve into something um, different than this. Just like my casual Fridays started out one way and kind of evolved, and my Technique Tuesday videos took a while for me to kind of figure out what I was doing with those and how I wanted to use them. So um, I think this is a, a great way to 
find out what you guys are interested in and uh, the kind of questions you have and suggestions that you have uh, for things that you'd like to see. So thank you so much um, for uh, joining me this evening. I was really, really happy that so many of you could join. Thanks so much. See you later. <laughs>